Hi everyone, I'm Robin. Welcome to Grassroots Voices with Robin and Friends where community and politics meet. So what I do at the top of the show, I go ahead and I share this episode uh, across uh, various Facebook platforms, um, various groups, various political groups uh, in Georgia and across the country. So it takes about uh, a couple of minutes for me to set this all up. So please be patient with me. Uh, we'll be getting started in one moment. Thank you so much. I'm really excited because we have a very special guest, uh, Representative B. When she is here uh, from Georgia, she's running for Secretary of uh, Secretary of State for Georgia. Uh, and so, let me just go ahead and set everything up, and then we will get started with her very soon. So I'll take about. I would say two, three minutes top. So if you are watching um, from or watching a replay, you can always forward about a couple of minutes and then that's when the actual show will begin. So just to give you a heads up. Okay, almost set up. Hi everyone, it's Robin uh, with Grassroots Voices. Uh, I will be getting started in one moment. I just wanna go through and share this episode across all the Facebook groups and then we will be getting started. Thank you so much for joining me uh, today. I'm so excited. We have a very special guest joining us, uh, Representative B. Wynn out of Georgia and she's running for Secretary of State in Georgia, one of the most one of the most important offices uh, in the state, and she'll be speaking with us uh, very soon. So if you can just give me um, one or two minutes, I'm going to go ahead and share this episode uh, across uh, various platforms, and then we'll get started in one moment. So if you are watching a replay, just go ahead and forward it maybe like two minutes, and you will be able to get the start of the episode. So just giving me one moment here. Beginning started in one second. Okay. Facebook is like, they've changed some of the options like in the last few weeks. So it's like, you're kind of learning on the fly, but um, it's fine. So just give me one more minute. I'm gonna go ahead and share this episode across the groups and then we'll launch into the show and we'll speak with our special guests. Representative B. Wynn, who is running for um, Secretary of State of Georgia. And that will be a very interesting conversation because as we know, Georgia is just completely on the map in regards to voter suppression and we wanna change that. So this is why we're bringing B on and having her share her vision for what she's seeing in regards to fair and accessible elections here in Georgia. So just again, give me one minute. I'm going ahead, I'm sharing this episode across the groups and then we'll get started. So if you are watching live, um, please drop in the comments if you have questions or if you wanna share any comments, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Same thing, if you are uh, watching a replay, please do the same. We'll hopefully come back and catch some of the comments uh, for future ep episodes. So. We wanna hear your input and we appreciate it. So we're gonna get, again, we'll get started in one more minute. Welcome to Grassroots Voices uh, with Robin and Friends. I'm Robin. This is where community and politics meet. And I'm just sharing uh, this episode across all the Facebook groups. Uh, there's a lot of them. And uh, so everyone can have a moment to jump on. And then uh, this week we're speaking with our special guest, Representative B. Wen, who's running for Secretary of State of Georgia, so you'll get a chance to hear from her uh, and meet her if you're not familiar with her already. And uh, we will get started in about 30 seconds. Thank you. Appreciate your patience. It's also election day um, here in Georgia. We're in the middle of the runoff, so we're gonna find out who's the mayor of Atlanta, hopefully by the end of the night or within the next couple of days. So that's exciting. Um, so let's see, 
Give me about 10 more seconds and then we will get going. I'm trying to get a little bit faster with all of this, but it's only uh, two of us handling everything. So thank you for your patience. We will get started in a minute. Please tag people, any political person or people who think they're political, <laughs> please tag them um, in the comments. This is going to be a great episode. It's going to be so important uh, to really hone in on voting rights and what's happening there, especially here in Georgia and Arizona, Texas, uh, North Carolina, all of these battleground states in the Sun Belt, uh, because it's going to come down probably most likely to these states once again uh, in 2022 and 2024. So it's really important to understand what's going on here. Even if you're not from Georgia, this is a place to uh, definitely keep your eye on. So we're going to get started and 10 more seconds and uh, I'll be bringing our special guest in. So again, if you're just joining, this is Grassroots Voices with Robin and Friends where community and politics meet. I'm Robin. We have a special guest today, Representative B. Wen, who's running for Secretary of State here in Georgia. I'm just sharing this episode across the groups and giving people a chance to hop on so they can join us in this episode. And then we will be getting uh, started in about 10 seconds. So again, thank you for your patience. And we'll be starting the show. All right. All right, so thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm Robin. Uh, this is Grassroots Voices uh, with Robin and Friends where community and politics meet. So we're gonna go ahead and start the show today. I'm super excited. Uh, we have uh, Representative B. Wynn joining us uh, here in Georgia. She's a candidate for Georgia Secretary of State. So if you don't know her, know her already, you'll get a chance to meet her today and hopefully get behind her and support her early on uh, as we continue to push for uh, fair and accessible elections. So I started Grassroots Voices uh, because I've just met so many people over the last decade, definitely in the last couple of years uh, here in Georgia, uh, in the political and social justice uh, spaces. And I've just met a lot of change agents and people who really value community and social change. And I wanted to provide a space to uplift their voices and elevate uh, their causes and share calls to actions that, uh, that they're doing. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. So if you haven't already, join Team Stacey Abrams Grassroots. We're a Facebook group. We're not an official Stacey Abrams group. Um, this is all made up of volunteers, grassroots supporters, grassroots leaders, uh, people who support voting rights, who support Stacey Abrams' uh, work around Fair Fight, Fair Count, and the Southern Economic Advancement Project. So we all congregate here into the Team Stacey Abrams Facebook group, and uh, we have about 23,000 members. So please join us. This is where we stream the show uh, and share information. So today uh, in this episode, we are going to meet B, uh, Representative B. Wynn. She's the candidate for Georgia Secretary of State. We're going to hear why she's running and her vision for Georgia's elections um, and how the Secretary of State will impact Georgia elections into 2022, 2024, and beyond. So we're going to just take a quick uh, look at uh, B at work. Um, she has really been out there uh, speaking on behalf of not just Georgians, but um, people across the United States, uh, really out there speaking about uh, free and fair elections and accessible elections. And um, she's been really making the rounds uh, across uh, various media in the country. So we thought it would be fun to um, just go back and look at some of the work that she's been doing. And then we will bring her in uh, to have our conversation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share a video real quick and we will hear from B. A lot of people don't know that up until incredibly recently, Georgia was one of four states in the union in the country that had no hate crime legislation on the books. That changed with the death of Ahmaud Arbery. What, what would the significance be of a hate crime charge in this case? 
Well, I'm glad that you brought up the case of Ahmad Arbery because what I think about is centering the narrative of the perpetrator and the fact that the perpetrator said that it wasn't racially motivated, it exactly reminds me of what happened when Ahmad Arbery was killed. He was killed by three white men who hunted him down and they did not believe their crime was racially motivated. And in fact, the district attorney was not even going to prosecute the case and their defense was using citizen's arrest to stand your ground. And us, you know, all of us in Georgia recognized it to be exactly what it was. And it was passed with bipartisan support in our Georgia legislature. And that legislation includes protections not just for race, but for gender and sex. And so under this specific case here in Georgia, we know that the suspect in custody did target women that he blamed for one of his problems. And so we do want it to be treated as an hate crime. And we do want to also recognize that Law enforcement has issues of their own. When we heard about some of the things that happened, we heard the story of one of the victim's husbands, who is Latino, handcuffed by Cherokee County while his wife lay dying inside one of the spas. We also learned that one of the victims who, whose wife um, was shot at the gold spa in Atlanta, the victim, was, the victim's husband was crying out for help in Korea, and APD couldn't understand him. As he stood laying next to his wife's body, he attempted CPR. And so there are language and cultural barriers that exist in this specific case. Um, I, I, you know, we So this was one, a very uh, major incident that happened um, here in Georgia. Um, I was at the protest, um, Stop Asian Hate. Uh, and again, to live in a state like Georgia that doesn't have strong hate crime bills is just like very terrifying, especially when you're black or person of color and you're looking at the history. Um, but uh, what I loved about Representative B is that she always comes out to the protest. Um, she always speaks with constituents and listens to people. And it's really, you know, just very affirming to have somebody like that, that you know is um, in your corner, uh, who, someone who's running for office. So here's another video where um, Representative uh, B is talking about Republicans trying to seek and subvert Georgia elections. I'm round, Raffensperger or no Raffensperger, the GOP in Georgia has a clear plan to find the votes they need and lose the votes they don't. This is not a drill, people. This is not a drill. Joining us now to discuss this is Georgia State Representative B. Nguyen. She's running for Secretary of State in Georgia. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Uh, the Republican effort to subvert elections continues unabated in your state. Is there anything left for Georgia Democrats to do to stop them, or is this now totally up to Democrats in the United States Senate to try and tackle? Look, I think there is always opportunity for all of us to work at every level to overcome and fight back against this voter suppression and democracy subversion that we are seeing right now. Part of that is electing a Secretary of State who is not going to walk back on his word. The Secretary of State's office sent an independent observer to observe the November election as well as January Senate runoff, and they found no evidence of voter fraud. In fact, watching this unfold on the ground, Fulton County made tremendous improvements to the election process between the primary and general. One of those things was opening up State Farm Arena so that they could have hundreds of voters come in and not wait in those long lines. And so what we're seeing here is nothing new. It is the Secretary of State deflecting responsibility, laying blame on local election boards and Republicans using whatever mechanisms they have to utilize a power grab. This is not local control. There's no evidence that this is necessary. And instead of acting like the leader, the Secretary yes. of State should be, he's the chief elections officer. He is now following this rhetoric that is being pushed by Republicans across our state. All right. Yeah, it's just wonderful to have somebody that you know is actually in there fighting for you. And have has, has as much passion um, as you might feel as the voter. So I would love to introduce you to State Rep B. Wynn. Uh, she is one of five daughters uh, born to a resourceful mother and a father working as an orderly at a mental institution. He made minimum wage $3.35 an hour in 1981. Uh, at night, he would study in their basement apartment and use a cardboard box as his desk. He believed education was the only way to escape poverty. Uh, B grew up in Augusta, Georgia, and she graduated from a Georgia public high school. After that, she moved to Atlanta to attend Georgia State University, 
She started a local nonprofit to educate and empower young women. And she spent a decade in Georgia public high schools where she learned how to organize with her community and demand change for her students. Uh, B made history when she was elected to Georgia's House of uh, Representatives District 89, the seat formerly held by leader Stacey Abrams. At the Georgia State Capitol, uh, B has been a leading advocate for public education, criminal justice reform, and voting rights. During her tenure, B successfully overturned the exact match voter registration law and restored the right to vote for 53,000 Georgians impacted by the policy. As an entrepreneur and a community organizer, B believes in the power of everyday Georgians. And in 2020 and 2018, she opened up her personal home and joined hands with neighbors and volunteers to mobilize tens of thousands of Georgians to cast their ballot for democratic candidates. B knows firsthand the importance of free and fair democracy. And that's why she's running to be Georgia's next secretary of state. So again, if you want to support, you can go to www.b4georgia.com. And I'm happy to bring on Representative B for this conversation this evening. Okay, are you there? Oh, I was muted. I'm here. Hi, wonderful. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I don't even know where to begin because there's so much that's been happening um, in Georgia. And this show is, is really uh, a dedication to all the work. A lot of our grassroots supporters and volunteers um, in Georgia, most of our members are from Georgia. And then there's members across the country who've had an invested interest in Georgia, especially since the runoff. So um, thank you for joining us. And these are like the people who are, you know, out there making it happen um, every day that don't always get the attention, you know, that they deserve. So we just really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Oh, of course. I'm happy to be on. And, you know, I my roots are in organizing and advocacy. So I get it. It's like the hard work that is very unsexy and makes a huge difference. Absolutely. You can totally tell um, people who run for office if they come from an organizing background. I can al always tell. <laughs> <you can see. laughs> so let's talk about just, okay, so let's talk about just everything that's happening in Georgia. I love on your website, you said um, for um, in running for secretary of state that, you know, we don't want Georgia to be known as the voter suppression state. And, and I do, I, and I love that because on the flip, it's also becoming the state that's known for voter protection and, you know, supporting voting rights. So maybe can you just talk a little bit about maybe like what pushed you to run and specifically in regards to voting rights um, here in the state, what, you know, drove you to go ahead and take that leap to run for secretary of state? Well, it was not part of any kind of life plan I had. And in fact, writing for office was not really something that I envisioned myself doing, but it goes back to that advocacy and organizing background. And I was working in public schools in Atlanta and DeKalb for 10 years in the classroom with students every week. And I started to see how our legislature makes decisions that impacted the lives of the kids that I work with, um, including defunding our public education system every year. And that was really the impetus for me getting involved in politics because I knew that I was limited in terms of what I could do for the kids I work with without pushing for policy change. And it was very much the same experience serving in the legislature that led me up to this decision. So little did I know that when I was elected and assigned to the governmental affairs committee that that was the committee that oversees election laws. And so, for the first three years that I served, every single year, it was an introduction of some bill to make it harder to vote. And then watching some of those things manifest on the ground from doing both voter protection and mobilizing voters. And so you become recommitted to the cause. So, you know, the story that I always tell, or one of the stories I tell was last year, I was carrying a ballot for one of my neighbors who had been flagged and he lives in my neighborhood in Edgewood and it was during the pandemic. And I went to his house 
and knocked on the door. His brother answered. They were both older gentlemen that lived in the neighborhood and have lived there for a long time. And his brother recognized me from just running through through the neighborhood. He says, oh, when I go to Kroger, I see you running. And so he lets me into his house. And I said, look, your brother's ballot has been flagged. And what I need to do is have him sign this affidavit and send in a picture of his driver's license. And his brother came out and he bent over the counter and he had a pen in his hand and he, he was shaking the whole time he was signing because he was elderly. And he said, I'm going to do the best I can. Well, it turns out he doesn't have a smartphone. He doesn't have internet. He does not have an email address. So he relied on me, a total stranger during a pandemic, to take a picture of private information using my email address to email it into our um, DeKalb Elections Board in order for him to get his ballot counted. And that is so incredibly wrong. And so watching what happens at the General Assembly, watching how nefarious the efforts are, um, being on the front lines of it legislatively, understanding the law, and then seeing it impact people in real time. And I think most pressing was um, last year when we knew that there were attempts to overturn the results of the election in Georgia. And here I am in this committee meeting, you know, taking down Trump's expert witness and watching my Republican colleagues allow this charade to go on for hours and hours and hours, knowing that if I spoke up and I knew I would speak up, that I would get death threats. And it happened. And they let all of those things happen, knowing that the results of the election are legitimate. Oh my gosh. It, it's just so intense because I can't even imagine just the, like the level of like gaslighting <laughs> that you probably have to experience, you know, actually, you know, being next to some of these elected officials who are spouting, you know, a lot of these lies and various things. Um, can you talk a little bit about exact match? Cause I know like some people maybe have heard of it. Some may not have, but that was a huge victory, um, here in Georgia in regards to voting rights. Yeah, and I actually was a legislative aide the year that Republicans passed this law. So it's the law that says um, your name on your driver's license has to exactly match the name on your voter registration. And I watched Stacey Abrams go down to the well and she spoke against the bill. And she said, if you pass this law, it's going to impact voters of color, people with non-Anglo names. And it turned out to be true. So in 2018, that was 53,000 Georgians and 80% of them were Black, Latino, or Asian. Well, I've got a last name that people cannot spell or pronounce. Um, and I knew that my name is exactly the type of name that gets caught up in a system like that. Um, when I was elected, I knew I wanted to work on that. And I was thinking about how we could get it done because you all know being in the minority party, advancing something that is pro-democracy is nearly impossible. So I had written a bill ahead of legislative session, working with the Lawyers Committee and ACLU and Advancing Justice and a couple of other orgs. And I was just holding on to it. It was in my purse for most of legislative session. And I'm thinking through, how can I get this passed? And I remember having a conversation with some of my Democratic colleagues on the floor one day. And I said, oh, actually, I know what I'm going to do. I was like, I'm going to go to committee and testify. And then I'm going to ask um, Bob Tramp, who was our minority leader, to introduce this as an amendment to House Bill 316. And I knew it was a long shot, but they did a couple of things that were helpful for me, which was when I was elected, they misspelled my last name in three different places on the state house website in three different ways. <laughs> and then every time I got a committee meeting notice, my last name was spelled incorrectly. And I started saving all of those things. So when I testified, I brought a stack of committee meeting notices and I said, y'all can't even spell my last name correctly. And we just happened to have a folder in front of us that had all the names of the members of the committee. And they gave me a, a little extra bonus present, which was my last name was spelled incorrectly. And then Representative Renita Shannon's first name was spelled incorrectly. So I said, look, the two women of color on this committee, our names are spelled incorrectly. This is exactly an example of why we can't have policies that are predicated on clerical error. And we were able to overturn that um, as an amendment to House Bill 316. And, you know, it, it required a lot of strategy and tenacity and patience in order to do it. Um, but it, it was definitely a win for us in Georgia. And, and, you know, and like you said, a clerical error, 
that should not just mm -hmm. completely ruin a person's chance to cast their ballot and you know have a say in our democracy. Um, so I know on your website, it was talking about like prioritizing accessibility, efficiency, and equity. Could you talk a little bit about like what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, whenever I talk about this seat, you know, it, I talk about a couple aspects of it, right? One is this is going to be one of the most important seats that we vote on next year in Georgia, um, specifically because the Secretary of State's office is an office that certifies the results of the election. So ensuring that we elect somebody who is going to certify the results, whether or not she likes them, is critical. But there's so much more that we can do. And when I talk about it, I want to be very realistic. One is we have to think about what the Secretary of State's office can do with Senate Bill 202 in place, because we know it's going to be litigated in court. We don't know what the results will be and which parts will still stand after litigation. Two, um, especially after redistricting, we know that it will be a Republican-controlled legislature very likely. And so a lot of the changes we want to see, same-day voter registration, the ability to vote at any precinct, those things require legislative change. So you have to be very realistic about what the Secretary of State can do. The good news is there are a lot of improvements to be made across the board. And so I'm going to just, I'll talk about a few of those things. So when, when we think about the office, right, and the laws are changing so rapidly, the Secretary of State's office is not an entity that educates voters on how to ensure they can make their votes count, especially when it pertains to things like precinct changes, precinct consolidations, all the new rules around absentee ballot voting and the deadlines, um, and, and then very specifically the way in which they purge voters. So how I describe it is, look, if I were running for office, I would contact you in more than one way. Mm -hmm. When you are a voter and you are on a list to be purged, you get a postcard in the mail. And if you don't respond, they take you off the voter rolls. That is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. You do do the same things that we do as candidates, which is call, text, email, and mail a letter. Using all the information that we already have on hand to, in good faith, contact voters and ensure we keep eligible voters on the roll. When I'm sleeping at night, my phone buzzes and it's an Amber Alert. We have the capacity to do that. In fact, our city governments do that. 311 texts me. So it is investing in that voter communication and ensuring that we are acting in good faith so that voters can vote. And if they are eligible, they remain on the voter rolls. The second thing is investing in all 159 local election boards by providing the funding and resources and training across the board to ensure that every single county has the resources they need to run efficient elections. Under Senate Bill 202, we know that it no longer allows local election boards to apply for private grant funding, which was so critical in 2020 and 2021. The Secretary of State can do that, though. So as Secretary of State, I would act as a leader in garnering those financial resources and dispersing them equitably across the board and investing in adequate training so that poll workers don't accidentally disenfranchise voters, which I have seen before. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is language investment in language access. I recently was watching the 11th Court of Appeals, and there's a case before the court, and it is a case against Gwinnett County and the Secretary of State for failure to provide election materials in Spanish as it pertains to absentee ballot voting. Now, under federal law, Gwinnett is a county in which they provide language translations on voting day and election day at the poll, right? Their argument for refusing to do it for absentee ballot material is that it does not inhibit equal access to the polls because they said, well, if you don't vote absentee, then you can go in person. Therefore, we're not. And the judge literally said, why don't you just put a button on the website that says in Espanol? <laughs> it's because there's no political will. So investing in translating the portal to request your ballot and other elections related information in our top spoken languages in Georgia automatically increases access, recognizes that we are a diverse state, um, and, and we use that same model for the corporations division, for example. And then the last thing I want to talk about, which I think is critically important, is really tackling election disinformation and creating a division that solely focuses on election disinformation, cybersecurity, and foreign interference with our election system. And part of that model is 
hiring top-notch security experts who are monitoring these off-site um, non-traditional internet mm-hmm. places for and who are dispersing disinformation. And when a threat is identified, working with state and federal law enforcement and our local election boards to brief and provide mitigating talking points, but also ensuring that there's a representative from the Secretary of State's office who's actively working with communities and spaces we know Georgians are listening, right? And so partnering with chambers and libraries and being able to disperse that information to mitigate disinformation. Yeah, no, that's extremely important because that disinformation, misinformation is so insidious. And in a lot of times what if people, you know, aren't aware, they think they're sharing something or sharing some information that they might not believe in. And then they're just like helping to spread that disinformation, misinformation. So, I mean, I really appreciate that that's something on your radar. And then speaking of, um, can you talk and just touch on a little bit about the the big lie about the voter fraud and just really how that impacted Georgia or how it could potentially impact other places and just um, just what's at risk, you know, when when these things are allowed. Well, everything is at risk, right? It's a combination of the big lie and disinformation that is designed to tear people apart and divide us. And so I think what has been most alarming to me is talking to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who fully recognized that the election wasn't stolen, but they were too afraid because their base believed it. But their base believed it because they coordinated talking points to sow seeds of doubt as it pertains to the results of the election. And it was coordinated not just in Georgia, but across our country as a whole. And I remember last year, they started this uh, active campaign to sow seeds of doubt as it pertains to absentee ballot voting. And, you know, I think it's important to talk about the fact that in Georgia, no excuse absentee ballot voting without an ID was passed by Georgia Republicans. And up until last year, they used it more widely than Democrats. And at no point during that time did they ever bring up any concerns around the security or the validity of vote by mail until last year in a pandemic. And they recognized that because Democrats were going to use it in wider numbers. They had to um, start sowing seeds of doubt. And so they started coordinating these messaging points ahead of the primary results, ahead of the general results, so they could set themselves up to challenge the results of the November election. And as we saw, it was a manipulation of their voters. We also saw that election laws are complicated and the process that occurs on the ground Um, in our election offices can be confusing. And so as an average person watching this, you may think some of it is weird, like the ballot duplication that creates pristine ballots because a ballot has been soiled or because it's military overseas. Those are standard election practices. But what Republicans did was they took advantage of the fact that we don't are not as familiar with what happens inside election offices and then they lied about it and it worked. Um, and it, and that is incredibly dangerous. And what they are now saying is, look, we had to pass in Bill 202 because of the lack of faith in election and they call it election integrity. Well, that lack of faith only exists because you lied about it. Mm-hmm. No full well that your base and your voters would believe it And now they're at a point where instead of trying to mitigate the harm that we saw on January 6th, it's just doubling down on that big lie. And that is their, that's their winning strategy. That's so sad. That's pathetic, but it's, you know, it's, it's out there, but I I do think, you know, more (laughs) people are becoming more and more aware, hopefully. Um, And, and and I'm, I'm kind of like circling back to a point you mentioned earlier, and it has to kind of do with the big lie too, because can you just touch on what like it means where when like um, different places, counties, like they can't get uh, outside funding to help run their elections and how that can bankrupt, you know, the entire county or city and, and the fact like, especially if there's a constant challenge, you know, over and over again to the results, like what that looks like. Oh, yeah. And, and that's also, you know, the inability to have these 
the the private grant funding, which was used by both sides of the aisle. It was used by Republican led counties like Cherokee County. And it was instrumental, especially when counties cannot afford to purchase new equipment. And especially when it's becoming harder and harder to become a poll worker and who can blame poll workers because now they are under attack and they fear for their safety, right? And so what we're seeing is crippling election boards financially and Yes, they can go to the county commission and get more money, but guess who ends up paying for it? Voters do. Mm. We and Senate Bill 202, the fiscal cost of it increases the burden on election boards. So here we are, we've passed a bill that makes it more expensive to run elections. And then we took away the ability for local election boards to find that additional funding, which was available to all 159 counties. Mm. And the Conversation around that during the legislature was incredibly disingenuous. There were counties who opted not to because they didn't need it. They were smaller counties. And there were counties who opted to use it because they were more populous. But it was available to everybody. And it had no strings attached in terms of political meaning. And it was used for hazard pay. And it was used to buy additional machines. I mean, those are things that help everybody in the state of Georgia. Um, and, and even the characterization of some of that money, right? There was a pot of money that came from um, Schwarzenegger and his folks. And then there was a pot that came from Zuckerberg. And they call it liberal Zuckerberg money to try to insinuate that there was some kind of uh, quid pro quo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wanted to say the whole time, liberals don't even like Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Blame him, guys. <laughs> but again, it was that disingenuous framing of, you know, trying to take away resources and justifying why they wanted to do that. And then they did it. So what would you tell, I guess, like, you know, coming from that organizing and community building background, what would you tell activists, advocates, people who've just really been giving their all the last few years uh, in the political and social justice space? Like, do you feel hopeful? Do you feel like, you know, we got to get ready to fight for our lives? Um, where are you, like, what would you tell them and where are you at with everything? It's a, I think it's a combination of both things, right? I think when you are in an organizing space and you are working on issues that um, are really emotionally taxing and you carry the trauma of that work, um, one of the reasons you do it is because of hope for change and because you believe in a greater ideal. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, you recognize the reality of what we're facing. And so for me, when I'm looking at the state of our country, I'm very, very concerned about our future. I think that uh, we only have a couple of chances to get this right before we lose our democracy as it is now. And then when we do, it's going to be very hard to get it back. And who knows how long we'll be in that space, right? But the hopeful side is we have to live up to a higher ideal. And if we don't do that work, then nobody is going to do it for us. And part of it is, you know, this belief in the cause. But I, I also, when I am able to um, have the opportunities, I always say, look, it's not the job of organizers to carry the emotional burden and the weight and the responsibility on their shoulders. And what makes me really ashamed and angry is watching the same folks who were fighting for the right to vote decades ago, having to do the same thing. And I want our elders to be able to rest. And some of this, we simply can't even out-organize. So I think that, you know, in a, in a space um, for people um, who are doing this really hard work, um, I do think that um, it's critical, it's necessary, and it's unfair that they are the ones who have to carry the burden of the work. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hope to see is um, that when we start electing better people, like our two senators behind us, they can help shoulder some of that burden. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the 
great things about Georgia that I love is we have a really powerful organizing structure, but what you also see is always the same people on every issue, on voting rights, on criminal legal reform, on immigration reform. Um, and it's hard and we need, we need to be in a space where we can protect the people that are doing the hard work. Yes, absolutely. And I was going to say too, uh, when, when you were saying just in Georgia, there's so many inspirational figures and leaders, you know, elected and not elected, but who, who, or what kind of really like inspires you and motivates you, I guess, to be out there on the front lines and to do all of this work. Oh gosh, there's so many good people, like you said, right? Um, I would say that the it's always been family because my two parents are refugees that came from Vietnam and they endured a war and civil conflict for most of their lives. And my dad was actually held in re-education camp for three years in a remote jungle in the middle of nowhere and subjected to hard labor and starvation. And who knows what happened in there because he doesn't really talk about it, right? Um, and then they got on a little boat and left in the middle of the night, leaving behind everybody they knew and loved um, to build a better life here in our country. And along the way, there were people who stepped in to help them do that. And one of those people was a veteran who had just come back from Vietnam. He repaired battered helicopters, and then he came back and then helped my entire family resettle. Um, so it's very much rooted in that family narrative, and especially because they came to our country in search of civil liberties that they didn't have in their own country. And especially because when we were growing up, they would always say, look, we never thought we were going to lose our country, but all the signs were there and the writing was on the wall. We just didn't ever believe it. And I think that we are facing something very similar. All the signs, are there, the writings are on the wall, but we don't fully believe we could be in a constitutional crisis or we could lose um, the country that we know, right? And so it's that, it's the students that I work with in public schools. They taught me so much and they helped me stay grounded and rooted and they help me understand my why when I'm in the legislature, which is not a very fun place to be. And it's very hard, right? Um, so certainly my students. And then um, I spoke about the organizing community in Georgia. I just think that, um, you know, obviously I have the highest respect for Stacey Abrams, um, but also there's NSA and there's uh, Miss Latasha Brown and there's Cliff, Cliff Albright. Um, and are all the folks in Brunswick, Georgia, who really held the ground and fought for their community um, when it comes to um, seeking some sort of accountability for Ahmaud Arbery, when if they hadn't stepped up, if his family hadn't stepped up and the community stepped up, we might have never even seen a trial in the first place. And then they got rid of that district attorney who said she wasn't gonna prosecute. And I, I think that demonstrates the power of organizing community and demonstrates how we wield that power to vote. In um, Brunswick, Georgia, they ousted the district attorney who refused to prosecute the killers of Ahmaud Arbery. I mean, Georgia is a really special place. Absolutely. It really is. <laughs> and, and it's so true. I mean, even with um, everything that you're saying, I, I I've organized in various places in the country and it's just definitely something special happening here. And there's a lot of people across the country who are invested in Georgia and want to come here and help and do whatever they can in 2022. So can you just tell people any calls to action or what, what they can do to best support you and your candidacy? Um, well, uh, financial resources are obviously very important and it's kind of funny because you know, part of running the statewide campaign, the most unglamorous part is calling people and asking them for money. But I talked to folks from all over the country. And like you said, everybody is very invested in Georgia. Um, and, you know, they, they are invested in us, they're inspired by us, but they're also watching how their state operates, right? And, and they're, they're in disbelief about how much Georgia Republicans are doing yeah. to undermine our democracy. Um, 
And, and, and now I think we're in a space where we understand we're no longer, it's no longer a silo. We can't operate in siloed states because what's happening with this specific race for Secretary of State is uh, Republicans are running a coordinated effort to recruit candidates who are far right and who have already verbalized that they do not believe in the legitimacy of the 2020 election. And they're targeting Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, all the swing states. And what their plan is, is to install one of these radical right people like Jody Heights in Georgia um, and maybe another swing state. And if they just pick up one or two states, mm. that state, Georgia, could be the deciding state in the presidential election. They're setting us up for 2024. Mm. So we, one person who refuses to certify the the results of the presidential election. And that impacts the country as a whole. So financial resources to ensure that we protect Georgia and we protect our country. And then I think for those folks who want to come to Georgia and organize, um, it is always important to follow the lead of the people who live here, which was the message that we tried to echo in 2021 when everyone was coming down for these two guys behind me. Um, as well as in 2020. And I have no doubt people will be coming for Stacey Abrams. They will. Because they did in 2018. They will. Um, so, <laughs> certainly, I think one of the most important things is listening to the folks who are doing the work and, and taking their direction. Absolutely. I told uh, Dominic Perkins, um, he, or I, know, I know you know, but to everybody else, he's yeah. the political director for the Georgia Democrats. Uh, and I interviewed him like a week or so ago. And I was just like, well, you may just want to go ahead and get a, like a department ready, you know, for any kind of host of, you know, out of state visitors, because everyone is so excited about Stacey, hopefully, and then Warnock, and of course you, I mean, because this is going to be a national race as well. Um, I mean, because everyone saw how important that Secretary of State position was in 2020. And now more than ever, we have to definitely pay attention and uplift um, those people who are Democrats who are running for Secretary of State. So thank you so much. I know you are so busy and you have a lot going on. And just, I really appreciate you taking the time and connecting with everybody. And hopefully you'll come back maybe in 2022 as things get oh, yeah. going. I went to. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you for having me on and thank you for all of the amazing work that you have done and are doing. Um, you know, it, it is so incredibly important. Um, like you said, it's like the sec unsexy work that doesn't get enough credit, but it's instrumental and we cannot do it without our Georgia organizers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. And we'll post on um, your website and, you know, all the calls to action will follow along um, as your candidacy, you know, continues and hopefully you'll come back and please let us know anything that we can do to support you. I will. Thanks, Robin. Yes. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Okay. Take care. Yay. Well, that was fantastic. I'm so happy we were joined by such an amazing person like B. And I'm going to play um, just for those of you who have not seen uh, her announcement when she announced that she's running for Secretary of State, I'm going to go ahead and play that. Democratic State Representative B. Nguyen. State Representative B. Nguyen. Democrat B. Nguyen. B. Nguyen is the representative for Georgia's 89th district, Georgia lawmaker B. Nguyen, who single handedly debunked the claim of voter fraud by Team Trump. Here's the truth I cannot find one single case of voter impersonation. There is no voter fraud. What they're afraid of is that we see that it works when we build broad based coalitions. The allegations and the numbers produced were inaccurate. Republicans are acting in bad faith because they did not like the results of the election. I'm a daughter of Vietnamese refugees, and my parents came to this country for the basic fundamental rights that we Americans 
uphold as sacred values. The right to free speech, the right to peaceful assemble, and the right to free and fair elections. Growing up in a state like Georgia, I'm part of what we call the New South, a coalition of black, brown, Asian, young folks, progressive folks who want to see a state and a country that embraces diversity and that understands that cultural differences and what we contribute makes our country unique and special. You've announced that you're running for Georgia Secretary of State. An ambitious Democrat has entered the chat. State Representative B. Wynn. What is at stake in this campaign to be the next Secretary of State? I believe that we need a Secretary of State who relies on facts, which I have relied on facts and truths, given my record with fighting against voter suppression, who also will stand up to voter suppression bills like Senate Bill 202, which the Secretary of State currently embraces, even though it strips him of his own powers. I believe that it is my duty to step up and not shrink back. And I'm here to say I'm a Georgian, I'm American, I care about our state and our country, and I'm here to serve just as I've been serving for most of my adult life. I believe Georgians have a choice and we can do better. Yay, what a dynamic uh, commercial. Uh, so anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the show. Uh, we can't be in better hands than with Representative State Representative B. When uh, she is definitely a firecracker and she is just ready to get in there and do the work that we need to do in order to protect the vote here in Georgia and uh, beyond. Because what happens here can then go on to affect and impact other states and precedents. So we have to keep our eye very closely on democracy, which leads me to our call to action we've been doing throughout the fall, Fair Fight Action has launched their Freedom to Vote Fall. You want to call your senators today, even if you've called them before, keep calling them. That number is 833-465-7142. It's important, regardless if you're in a blue or red state, Republican or Democratic uh, state, that you call and let your voice be heard. That's what this is really about. And let them know that you're paying attention and that you want federal voting rights legislation passed. So please call and demand that from your senators. Also, we're calling uh, President Biden. Uh, when the White House opens their comment line each week, we we'll call uh, President Biden and ask that he continue to pressure the Senate to eliminate the filibuster. So again, yes, it's not only up to the president. It's it's really you know in the Senate, but the president still wields and holds power, and we are the ones who voted him in along with our senators. So we want to let President Biden know that we would like to see them eliminate the filibuster or carve out exceptions, whatever needs to happen to pass the legislation that we all uh, voted on uh, back in 2021. So next week uh, is my, it's the 18th episode on Friday, I'm sorry, not next week, this Friday, sorry. We have two shows this week. Um, so this Friday, December 3rd, I can't believe we're already in December, my birthday season. Shout out to all the Sagittarius's. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, it's episode 18, uh, December 3rd, which is a Friday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we will have a show about Haiti reclaiming their voice and agency of people's self-determination. And we'll be joined by two special guests, two dear friends of mine uh, will be joining me uh, who are very well versed in a lot of the uh, political and humanitarian uh, issues and crisis and things that have been going on in Haiti and how that impacts immigration. So we're going to have a wonderful conversation with them. So please uh, just bookmark that for Friday, December 3rd at 5.30 p.m. That's this Friday. Uh, and we'll, again, we'll have our next episode. And then we're continuing to support Beto for Texas, uh, Beto running for governor. So please continue or please consider getting on his email list or becoming a monthly donor. Same thing with B when consider becoming a monthly donor for her campaign uh, to support her. Uh, we're also calling Brian Kemp, uh, governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp. We are demanding that he expands Medicaid. Uh, it's just so cruel that he will not do this. It's one of the few states uh, in the country, most states in the South, where these Republican governors will not expand Medicaid in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a crisis where uh, all kinds of hospitals are being closed across uh, the state here in Georgia. I think there's been uh, 10 hospitals uh, closed within like the last like 10 years. 
several of them have been in rural areas. So if you can only imagine having to drive 90 miles or an hour away just to go to any kind of hospital or urgent care, I mean, it's just, it's simply cruel. So we're calling uh, Brian Kemp to demand that he expands Medicaid. If you haven't already, join our Team Stacey Abrams Grassroots Facebook group that I mentioned at the top of the show. Join our sister groups, Team Georgia Blue, Stacey Abrams Fair Fight Club, Stacey Abrams for President, A Blue Georgia for a Stronger and Progressive America, On Voice for Humanity, Disability and Democracy, and the Rural Progressive and Afro Southeast Georgian. So those are all Facebook groups. Join them. We post about different information. We have different conversations, uh, but they're all rooted in uh, democracy, social justice, and uh, furthering uh, progressive policies. If you have any comments, show ideas, or guest suggestions, please email me at grassrootsvoices999 at gmail.com, and I will be happy to try to incorporate some of your suggestions or recommendations for the show. Uh, I will read all the emails and do my best to, uh, again, incorporate anything that you suggest. And if you want to support this show, it takes work, it takes time, it takes energy, you can support it through grassroots donations. Some people like to do that. $3, $5, $10. You can Venmo me or PayPal me if you like. Uh, this is a labor of love. This is not my regular job or career or anything like that, but uh, I think it's important and it does support, you know, things I believe in as well. So I just like to do this and it's fun to talk to people who are out there creating social change. If you don't want to do the grassroots donations, that's fine too. Just like and share this episode tag a friend in the comments, join our groups, and just keep fighting for voting rights no matter what. Uh, again, keep calling your senators. If you do that, you know, that's a huge help to the show as well. But again, uh, we're just out here doing our best to uplift the work of those people who are in the trenches. And for those of us who are in the trenches, just to provide a space for you to support and put your money or your energy your time uh, towards a cause uh, that you believe in and you know put you in put you in the hands of people who are actually out here doing the work every day. Other than that, this is the end of the show. I will see everyone on Friday, December 3rd. Uh, that's where we will have the episode about Haiti. And uh, other than that, just please make sure that you like this episode, share it again, tag people in the comments, join our groups and keep fighting for voting rights. So again, my name is Robin. This is Grassroots Voices with Robin and Friends where community and politics meet. And I'm Robin. Thank you for joining the show. And uh, I will see everybody next week. <laughs>